today is April 2nd, and this is the 2015 Facilities Geospatial Technology Showcase. This six-month webinar series is hosted by the Campus Facilities Technology Association and organized by the University of Kentucky. I'm Michelle Ellington, and thank you to all attendees joining us today. Today's webinar is being recorded. Both the recording and slides will be made available on the CSTA website. The presentation is estimated to run 45 minutes, with the remaining time dedicated for Q&A. Feel free to send any questions during the presentation using the questions dialog box. Your question will be added to the queue and answered at the end or as time is allowed. I want to extend a special thank you to today's presenter, Jose Delgado. Jose serves as a program manager for the University of Southern California's Engineering CAD Services. He will be presenting on the current life cycle based BIM requirements and deliverables at USC. Jose, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so I guess I'll get started. Uh, first, a small correction to the original title. Um, originally, I think we had called it Contractor Submittal Requirements. And uh, I wanted to make sure it was Contract Submittal requirement, Requirements because uh, uh, this is important because at the University of Southern California, the architect and the engineer typically have more BIM work to do and deliver than the general contractor. And so um, that's a small change from the advertised title a long time ago. Uh, I also wanted to point out that this presentation is a very compressed version of our typical kickoff meeting. I decided to uh, use a lot of the material from that. At this six-hour meeting, normally, uh, we bring in uh, teams in early and clearly clarify what is expected of them. And uh, we have a discussion about this with them. Um, we typically require that the BIM manager be present and not just the project architect or the, or the uh, principal, as uh, usually happens. Uh, finally, I want to say that uh, these are not new ideas. Uh, we probably borrowed from, uh, from or directly from our, uh, unconsciously, from others out there. And so, um, there. Um, so, hmm, one second. Okay, first some information about the university. Um, you have there a University Park campus, which is about two miles south of LA. And you have there our um, Health Sciences campus, which is about two or three miles northeast of LA. And this is our Catalina campus, which is about 26 miles off the coast of LA, about uh, 15, 14 buildings out there. Uh, so we have a total of about 420 buildings, about 18.5 million square feet. Uh, it's a private university. Uh, people are surprised to hear that sometimes. Uh, and uh, it's, it was founded in 1880, and so that's about uh, the university. Um, so I want to get right into the, the deliverables, and I want to point out that, uh, uh, of course, they're listed on, on our BIM guidelines several times, and they are uh, Exhibit 5 in our standard contract. Uh, the BIM guidelines are Exhibit 5. And so, so I'm going to just uh, just just start with the deliverables, and then I'm going to go into uh, detail. Uh, what are these deliverables? How are they uh, created and delivered? And then, and of course, why we have these deliverables at USC? Uh, so number one on the deliverables is we want the, the rev design model from uh, the architects and engineers at the end of uh, construction documents, 100% construction documents. We want the Revit asphalt, or as we call it here, the as-constructed cons as model from the design team. Uh, this is a model that the design team keeps up to date through the construction and administration stage of the project. And we want the native format models from the GC and subs. Uh, these are the up-to-date chop models from the GC and subs. And of course, we want uh, the COVID data and documents from the GC team. Uh, so uh, in the rest of the presentation, I will cover more detail of what these are and how they're created and, of course, why. Uh, so these are the BIM guidelines here at USC. Uh, we started back in uh, 2006 looking seriously at, uh, this, at requiring BIM for phase one of the cinematic arts building. Uh, from the very beginning, we used Revit and AutoCAD base tools. And but the reason for that is that's what we have in our toolbox, of course. Uh, the first document on the left, we, uh, we completed uh, in 2012, that was for design build projects. And the last one on the right, uh, second, then, then came the one in the middle for, for GMP kind of projects, and then the one on the right for uh, civil work. Um, 
these are, are by no means perfect. Uh, there's a lot of uh, improvements that are required. But uh, this is the way they develop based on our specific needs here at USC. So uh, the BIM guidelines uh, are being used for to complete about 16 projects. Some of them are scrolling up on the screen. Uh, the ones without square footage are remodels, and the ones with square footages are, are new buildings. Uh, so these uh, 16 projects uh, total about uh, two and a quarter million square feet, all of them since about around 2012 uh, to the present uh, going on right now. And so we, with so much taking place, we felt it was important to have guidelines in place for how to how we wanted the BIM delivered. Um, so again, there's 16 projects, and even even as we were learning before 2012. Uh, before the guidelines were completed, uh, we had 11 additional buildings totaling about 450,000 square feet completed with various levels of BIM uh, implementation. Uh, that was before we issued the first version of the guidelines. So uh, that's, uh, like I said, well, actually it's just under two and a quarter million. It's uh, 2.1 million square feet. feet. Oh, so the criteria for uh, requiring BIM, um, of course, um, like I said before, it's important to include it in the contract, and this prevents any kind of additional fees that uh, that may be uh, they may come up from either the design team or construction team or, or um, third parties, and any kind of scope creep. Uh, so uh, I, I looked at our uh, our BIM, guide, our, our BIM guidelines in the contract, and our BIM guidelines are referenced uh, 11 times in our contract. Uh, so, so there, that's a criteria up there for which build which buildings will, which projects will, will uh, have a, our guidelines in the contract. If a project is over five million, and if a project has significant MEP work, and if uh, there is a model existing for the, the current project, current uh, building. So um, many of you may be familiar with the benefits of the promise of BIM. Uh, one specific difference here at USC uh, is, is, is the, the greater urgency to gain efficiencies during designing construction. Um, and uh, I suspect it may be true with others, uh, other large institutional building owners as well, those who, who build a lot and not just uh, build uh, one building once in a while. Um, again, a big difference at USC is, is that we always spell out our intent to continue to use the models to manage the facility. Uh, in fact, we want to be able to troubleshoot the, the, the problems in the building using the model. And we want to send out the right person with the right tools to, to do the job. Uh, this kind of uh, intent may be more common uh, lately. I, I remember a uh, 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 pr uh, person from uh, Western Michigan, I think, had a similar uh, intent last last time. Um, beyond the benefits during designing construction, I'd like to continue with the why for BIM deliverables. Uh, again, I, I'd like to clarify, as Michelle said, that I work for facilities management and uh, not for capital construction. Uh, and in my department, we do not build buildings. We, we maintain them. However, um, we partner with the capital construction development department and they are, are they are very interested in delivering the information we need to do what work and delivering it uh, with the model as well as in uh, traditional methods at you at, at USC facilities is involved in the project almost throughout we update the basis of design documents for the university we are involved in the interviews for the design engineers and the major MEP subs we provide feedback through design, and we are also involved and in manage the commissioning and closeout documents. Uh, so although we, uh, like I said, we work in facilities, we don't build buildings, we're very involved in the uh, building and, and, and construction of the buildings because we are going to maintain them. Uh, this, we came up with this workflow back in 2008 when USC hosted the CFTA conference. Um, this still represents the ongoing use of the models being delivered. Essentially, we want to quickly download and link information from the model into our existing enterprise systems. Um, we want to use existing tools 
already in place. We want to use existing standards like COBE and master format. Uh, and over the years, we tried several manual methods to get this accomplished um, with all those uh, buildings that I listed before. <coughs> uh, but we want the process to be automatic. And we want the process to be repeatable for multiple buildings. Uh, and uh, this, is, this diagram here is relevant uh, to, to the BIM deliverables uh, here at USC. Again, once again, uh, we intend to continue to use the model uh, for managing the facility and to troubleshoot. On the top, you see some of the existing databases. And at the bottom, we see the model. Uh, we need something in the middle uh, to quickly and effectively be able to download critical information and knowledge to our, to our systems uh, and download it at substantial completion. And then we need to continue to connect them together moving forward. So uh, this slide has a lot of detail in the background. With we, we use it during our kickoff and other meetings, um, with regards to how the data in, is transferred and to the whole process. But what I wanted to focus on here is that at USC, uh, the design model. Excuse me. Uh, the design model is the one that goes from uh, the one that the facilities management wants to continue to use. That's and so that's the one that needs to be uh, updated. So this this slide here shows a lot of uh, construction users for a lot of post-construction users for the model. Uh, one, once again, the particular difference between uh, BIM and perhaps other places is that we plan to continue to use the model. And uh, up here, I'll focus on some of the uh, uh, facilities management and uh, operations and maintenance uses. And again, once again, this is relevant because uh, uh, it's important to how uh, the model is pre prepared. Uh, by the right people early on. Um, wanted to show this slide. Uh, this, this is uh, this is our personas. This, re this is representative of the people who are going to use the model here at USC. Uh, this came about at one point when we brought our software partners here at uh, uh, to campus, and we showed them what we wanted to do. We showed them the previous slides, and and, and they said they asked us why and what are the benefits. And so we conducted a process of interviewing and, and, and interviewing our staff. And we narrowed all of the staff into these kind of uh, representative uh, personas. Essentially, we wanted to answer uh, for, for ourselves and for uh, our software partners, uh, who is going to use the BIM model? What are they doing today? And how would using BIM make their daily work any easier? Um, so. Again, these, once again, these are the people who will be using the model. In this slide, I wanted to show you how, an example of how we would use the, the model. Uh, the model is prepared with our viewpoints on the left. Um, there, this is, again, coming from the design. We have, uh, it's colorized correctly, colored by, by, uh, by, uh, by uh, systems. The, the ceiling is transparent, so you can see right through the ceiling. So in here we have an emergency, uh, responding to an emergency in room 201. And we're able to find 201 because the model was prepared uh, correctly. We have the uh, assets that are in room 201 because they're parametrically aware to the model. Uh, we have the data coming through for, for the gate valve that is, uh, so the problem is there is a leak in room 201. There's water coming through the ceiling. And we, have, we know that the system, because it's coming from the model, we're able to link out automatically to an asset, uh, to our enterprise document management system. We're able to find information uh, for the uh, for the, the valve. Um, probably in retrospect, we probably should have uh, uh, looked at the, the single line diagram to see where we can shut it off. But uh, wanted to point out that the the link and the data and the systems that are in the Revit model are coming across into our uh, model viewer here uh, and these are created automatically and repeatable uh, in different buildings. Uh, this is this is uh, an example of how you respond to a hot and cold call for a um, problem. Like once again, uh, we have a call that is, uh, room 201 is too hot, and so we're able to find find the room 201. We're able to look at the uh, it's uh, not a good view in this case. Uh, we're able to look at the contents of the room, the the assets in the room. It's uh, it's too hot, so 
we're look, we, we, have, we know the BAV that controls that room is BAV24. We're also able to look at the system uh, because it's named properly and it's coming from the model through this to our normal uh, model delivery process. We can isolate the system. Uh, and going back to the piece of equipment uh, that we need to, to look at because the room is too hot, the information on the, on the right is coming through from the model uh, telling me some uh, information from the schedule. And I can link out it once again to my enterprise uh, document management system. And I can link out again, uh, automatically through our uh, energy management system that tracks the live status of that BAV valve. Uh, so these links are made possible and this data is coming across because we required certain uh, things in a model deliverable and I'll cover those in, in a minute. So um, moving on to the uh, how the model is created and delivered. Um, we covered last, somebody covered last week uh, the University of Michigan, the BIM execution plan. So I'm not going to go into too much detail, uh, but I wanted to cover some of the, some of the things in our joint BIM execution plan that are, I think are unique. Um, let's see. Uh, one thing that we developed here at USC is we require a joint BIM execution plan, not just an, from the architect separately a BIM execution plan or from the contractor, but we sit them both in the room and they come up uh, with, uh, with it, with the plan, uh, as soon as possible. And it changes when the contractor comes in, if, it come, if they're hired in afterwards. But we usually hire them early on, at least for pre-construction services. Uh, and so everybody is aware of what to expect from each other. There's no surprises. No, there's no uh, added, added fees later on, or as little as possible. Another thing we, we do differently here at USC, uh, if you look on the bottom uh, uh, of the uh, appendix, we have we require the everybody to sign the joint BIM execution plan, the architect, the contractor, and of course the owner. Uh, on the right, on the, on the BIM uses, we clearly identify who's doing what. Uh, and uh, in here, I'm, focus, I'm pointing out the, the model deliverables that, of course, I, I already described previously. Uh, we have a BIM process uh, design as well. And again, uh, we make sure that uh, they come up with a, a specific process map for each of the deliverables uh, that are highlighted on the lower right there. Uh, I wanted to share this tool uh, with everybody. At the, at, we, we adopted this tool. It's called the M3 modeling matrix uh, from the Army Corps of Engineers. We find it useful because it breaks down the building building project in in the in, in the rows on the left by omni class in, or, or omni for uni, uni format or master format. So um, it's something we're familiar with, and uh, we find it very useful. Uh, because we already use these classification systems. We also like the way that this document describes the, the level of detail uh, for the 3D geometry using standard 100 to 500 uh, LOD criteria. But, but an additional thing that, that I, I was happy to see here is that there was a, a level of data richness to the model uh, that was also identified here in the letter grades. Uh, the letter grades are, are uh, the second column, but that what that means is the A is uh, 3D facility and data, and for example, the C is 2D only, and if there's a plus, then the, it means that the original data is uh, adjusted, or if the minus uh, means that it's not included. And so it tells you if, if the data is, if there is data, or if it's just 3D geometry, or if, um, and if it's going to be updated. That's, that's, I find that very, very useful and very, very helpful. And also the whole thing spells out in this, this kind of standard uniform or master form or whatever they prefer, exactly what they're going to do and what their, their team members are going to, uh, to uh, expect from them. It is a team, team support after all. And this next um, slide, I wanted to uh, focus in the middle there, uh, something we added here at USC. Um, we, we have the concept, as I said, of the as constructed model. Uh, and so, because we, once again, we expect the design model to be updated, so we require that uh, the design team tell us exactly how they're going to make the model uh, updated or not. Again, you see the plus, the A, uh, pl a plus, or the uh, no plus, uh, if it's, or if it's C or A or B. Quickly, that, that's a red flag for me telling me that 
the, uh, if it's just a, a, a C, it's only 2D, and so that's not going to work for me uh, to be able to continue to, uh, to, to use it. Um, of course, we have a, a clash matrix, and uh, where I think is important here is uh, I want to focus on two things, the priorities on the top uh, of uh, what we maintain here as far as mechanical air conditioning things, and uh, the column in the middle where we track the days open. Um, why this is important is uh, we want to ensure the critical clashes are reduced and we both get a good design as well as a good model, updated model that we can uh, rely on to be uh, complete for our ongoing reference uh, to manage the facility. Um, over the years, we developed or adapted different checks and processes to ensure that the deliverables are, are, are useful to us, frankly. Uh, so this um, so this busy diagram is <laughs> is our uh, QC QA process to make sure that uh, things we require are communicated um, uh, among the team. Uh, they're evaluated constantly and, and checked. And uh, so basically, there's a lot of um, activity going on here. But we have the major phases on the lower left there: uh, S C D D and C D and, and constru construction and commissioning and close that. And then on the top, way, way on the top left, we start with a very strong and firm kickoff meeting. And we explain, like I said, in six hours or so, explaining our requirements. Uh, and then we perform three specific checks to ensure that our geometry is fully coordinated and that the model is adequately uh, data reached for our use. Um, to, to, uh, to help us out here, uh, I want to point out in, right in the light yellow there, on a, on a, under USC, we have a USCBC. That's a BIM consultant. We 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 conjure up this. Uh, we came up with this uh, uh, this idea of a third-party BIM consultant that we hire for the purpose of assisting the project manager uh, with regards to BIM. Uh, so there's a lot of activity, but I wanted to point out to you that, that we're looking to have the model made better and richer as the project progresses, and we're determined to have as little drop in knowledge as possible as the project progresses along. Uh, we rely on the person who is closest to the, inf to the information to be responsible for actually entering the information. And we believe that, the overall, that this overall delivers a better set of documents, a better estimate from the G schedule, uh, a better from the GCE, and ultimately a better building. Uh, essentially, it's, uh, it's uh, cheaper to spend the money now and then to pay it later by uh, um, uh, fixing the model or, or, or fixing problems in the building later. Um, so this is the scope of the BIM consultant. Um, scrolling down the screen, there's actually 12. Um, they're, they're essentially the, the, uh, the BIM eyes and ears for the project manager. Uh, as I said before, there are several checks and interfacing that goes on in our pr process here at USC. And looking back at the previous uh, slide, there's a lot of activity uh, at, at USC uh, with uh, BIM and uh, construction, and there's a lot of checks required. So we developed this BIM consultant to provide these scope of services. Um, and just to point out two or three is uh, number three on the list. There is produce monthly status reports for for the USC project manager and uh, our, our BIM committee there. Uh, number eight, uh, regular regular scheduled model model content checks um, that are that are in the previous diagram. Number eleven, uh, the uh, Schedule milestone mashup, um, which I'll cover in a minute, and and that they don't adjust the model anymore. That's the responsibility of the design team, but that's still in our scope up there. Number seven is interface between the AE team and the GC team and the USC stakeholders, like our, our BIM committee or our, our engineers or our shop supervisors. So we have a short list of local firms that we provide these types. They can provide these type of services. And the consultant is hired by the project manager and reports directly to him or her, and uh, and it's interviewed by uh, our BIM committee, as well as sometimes even the architect if it's already on board. Regarding the data content and uh, workflow to create the USC BIM deliverables, this is an overall view of the models and the components that make up the deliverable models. Uh, there a lot of uh, information up there. The design model provides the geometry to to the uh, to everybody and the design data. We then use the GC's model to get the design model updated. 
by doing the mashups. Uh, design team is responsible for the, continuing to update the model throughout the process. We, we require the design team to print bulletins from the model. That's another way of checking, of course, and to ensure that the model is getting updated. We then rely on the GC to enrich the model uh, with their COVID data and documents. This, this diagram here represents a mashup. Um, it's basically a comparison of the two models. The design models are, are, are shown in green and the con subcontractors models is shown in blue. Uh, the design team is provided with this comparison and they use this comparison as well as other processes to update their model, uh, like the responses to the RFIs and the bulletins to make sure the model is updated. So what are the detailed modeling requirements for our, for our deliverables? Um, these are, these are the, we typically cover each of these categories uh, during the kickoff meeting with the AEC, AE and the GC together. Uh, we typically cover, cover these, of course, with the BIM manager present uh, and, uh, and make sure it's the full understanding. And of course, this takes several hours, and sometimes this discussion goes on back and, back and forth with these uh, BIM managers. In each, sec in each section, we cover the requirement, of course. We give reference to where this is called out in our contract and our BIM guidelines. Um, and we show and discuss at least one or two ways of how to meet our requirements. We're also, we also tell them how we're going to check them for this requirement. And finally, we show them why we want this requirement, why it's important for the owner. So. Um, now we don't we don't require we don't require that everything have uh, meet all the requirements. Uh, they don't apply to everything. As soon as possible, we give them a list of what we call the major managed assets. This is a list created by looking at what types of assets we already manage in our CMMS. However, we focus this list on, on a specific project that, that we're looking at here. We start with what items. To do that, we start with what items are listed in the schedules, uh, typically. And those are the things we want in our CMMS, typically. Uh, since there, are, since the, a lot of the electrical drawings and plumbing drawings do not have schedules, we list items that are listed in the, with a tag on the floor plans. We then look at uh, diagrams and pick out equipment from there as well. So we want to keep a, get a comprehensive list of things we want to manage in our CMMS. We compare this list to to, to our CMM, a previous CMMS list. And then we finally we get this vetted by our shop supervisors and our engineering department. So yes, we require all, all objects to be named properly, but as far as the rest of the requirements, we only require this level of uh, detailed data, the documents, and the system connectivity that I'll cover in a minute for man major managed assets. We look at these major managed assets to be positionally correct uh, if and when, uh, for example, the GC uh, deviates from from the uh, shop from the design drawings during installation. So the naming requirement uh, is meant uh, to standardize across different buildings. Um, early on, we found that if we didn't, did not name uh, objects consistently uh, before before 2012, we, we had this problem, um, and even uh, shortly after. Uh, downstream, if you don't name it properly and consistently, downstream users like the GC and the subs, and then the owners, uh, they're not able to easily use the model in the database to enter their data. And so uh, we came up with this. Another way of explaining this, of course, is, is that if I'm navigating to the model or I'm looking through a list, uh, if I click on something, I want to know, understand consistently what it's called and not uh, whatever the uh, manufacturer called it, uh, called it or the family, uh, the family creator uh, called the family. Um, so the details for the, this is how the design teams are able to adhere to the requirement. Um, they're advised to, to, to do this. They're, they have to name the families according to our standards, the uh, Revit families. Within the family, they have to uh, rename the type names with, according to our standards. We also have a long description for amateur, parameter for each type. The instance name and description um, uh, are a little different color because they're optional in case the, uh, the team uh, doesn't want to rename families and types, they can use this parameter. Uh, so uh, as, as usual, we, we tell 
you tell them uh, where this requirement is called out in our guidelines and, uh, and in the contract uh, so to make sure it's clear and we give them additional guidance with an, an, a PowerPoint that explains uh, this is a, this is part of the the uh, PowerPoint and the appendix we detail how to name the family uh, we uh, uh, use uh, several examples we also provide a sample of how certain common objects such as doors plumbing fixtures and HPSC equipment can be named so we have a lot of training online for this um, so we have naming requirements to create you like I said, uniformity across different buildings and to make it easier for the GC to receive and understand the information. Uh, I believe this makes information exchanges much easier and therefore allows for a smoother transfer of knowledge. Uh, again, we didn't come up with these names. Uh, we rely on existing national and international standards. Regarding the second requirement for uh, parameter and data, uh, We uh, we this uh, we further split this into four categories. Uh, we call we have number one we have the master parameters, or I, I call them sometimes the hook parameters. These parameters allow us to interlink our various enterprise databases. Like in the video, uh, it cr makes it, makes it possible to have those links created automatically. Uh, the schedule parameters they need to be in the model, and the schedule needs to be parametric. Um, nothing uh, from AutoCAD or from another tool. <clears throat> uh, number three is a Kobe data. Uh, at USC, it's actually a very small amount of data, and I found this I found this um, that it's commonly misunderstood. Um, but if you have a very specific way of collecting it here, and I'll show you in a minute. And number four, we have what we call extended data, which we, we came up by uh, interviewing the the maintenance managers and facilities engineers, and they came up with very specific uh, set of parameters and data they would like to they find useful, uh, but uh, for our current projects, we haven't implemented these yet. They're just uh, listed uh, on our requirements. Of course, we we have we tell them again where this is called out, with reference to, so that uh, there's no no, no questions. Uh, this depicts our nomenclature parameter and master parameters. We have a spreadsheet on our website and a, a text file, share parameter text file, that the design team is able to download, and they're able to uh, um, to uh, load into Revit. As, uh, as the BIM program progressed, we, we found it useful to tell the design teams exactly how to load the parameters. We, we, uh, we, we had this list. We had, a, we had a list from the very beginning, this simple list based on our guidelines. But they were still not doing it correctly. They, were not, they, were, they, they kept coming back uh, to us. So we, we created the shared parameter file, and we, we have this exact naming, the no spaces. And then we, on the right hand, we, we tell them, uh, where to load it? Is it a type or instance parameter in Revit? Is it a shared parameter? Is it a system parameter? What group do we want it to, uh, so we can consistently find it? Uh, and then uh, which uh, Revit categories to uh, to uh, load it into? So uh, these are these are um, very detailed. Um, like once again, we, we we tell them exactly how to do it. Um, this slide here. Um, the details where where to where these uh, categories um, we were interested in, in loading the parameters in. Uh, for example, we want uh, the parameter to be loaded on specialty equipment, but we don't want the parameter loaded onto grids. Uh, similarly, we want the parameter loaded on fixtures, light fixtures, uh, but not for conduits. Uh, so these are standard Revit screens, uh, and we uh, we provide them as uh, to to everybody uh, during our training and on our website. Uh, so regarding the uh, schedule data, uh, so we, we believe that the requirement to have schedules come from parametrically from the model objects will will make for a better design. Uh, they will make for better design documents, they a better product from the GC for the GC to start off with, and ultimately, ultimately, uh, we as the owners get a better building and a more accurate, complete database. As as you recall from the video, the the data from the uh, from the schedules and from the families are coming directly into our uh, for us to use in the database. So we find it valuable. We find it valuable to have the person closest to the information enter the information. Uh, so if the design designer, or the engineer is designing, we want his information. We want his knowledge to go into the model, and not be uh, uh, 
uh, uh, paste it into the model for, for us for the print. And it, it just makes better sense all around, I think, uh, to, to have it come from the model. Um, so record, regarding the scheduled data, uh, once again, we, we, we I'll put this slide because uh, uh, actually we show them in case there's any question how exactly to do it during the kickoff meeting and we actually tell them how we're going to test their model uh, during the kickoff meeting. Uh, so um, regarding the COVID data, uh, we have a COVID deliverable uh, due and major milestones into our model viewer and then we, we check that uh, a check is made in Nicodemus to ensure things are, are, are working correctly at each uh, major milestone. Uh, so I want to clarify that at USC, COVID data is, is prepared mostly by the design team uh, with regards to naming things properly, um, part of the nomenclature. And most of the values that are entered are uh, completed by the construction team when material and equipment starts arriving on, on site. And so again, the right person answers the right information at the right time. Um, so this, on the, on the top left, is a sample of the COBE output in, in spreadsheet format. Uh, some may be familiar with that uh, out there, but we don't use the spreadsheet. Uh, so uh, as we use the web form on the right um, to, to do the data collection. So as you can see, we collect just a few fields for, for uh, what, what I'm showing there is the air handler. Uh, type and not a lot, not really a, a lot amount, like a big amount, like it's popular. In, uh, most people, most people say that Kobe is a lot of data. We believe that using this web web form makes the process much more manageable, um, and but putting it in a, a, a kind of a web cloud form rather than passing uh, spreadsheets around or uh, from different companies one to another. Or even worse, by possibly uh, you know passing the model along. Um, don't know how people do it, but again at USC we use this web form. Um, so again, this is the this is the online data entry form for uh, for the air handler. Uh, as you can see, there are clearly not a lot of fields. The the previous slide showed uh, some of the uh, same fields. Um, so again, there's not that many here at USC. Uh, our systems requirement. We require that, that uh, our models have systems for at least two reasons. Uh, this way we ensure that the team are using the BIM tools uh, for to, co to complete the design and we're not just trying to, to use uh, to get a printout for us. Uh, by using systems we believe that we, are, we as owners will be able to troubleshoot uh, the building with the model, with the models uh, because they are uh, adequately co connected. Um, so the specific checks for systems are, are um, on the screen. They, we check that the systems are named correctly. We have a naming, naming standard. We check that they're connected. Uh, we check that uh, flow directions are set correctly. And we check that uh, design data is included in the, in the, uh, in the um, system. Okay, this is our system nomenclature. Uh, as you can see, we rely on existing standards. Uh, we didn't uh, just make it up. Um, in our training we PowerPoint, we, on, we show them some samples of, uh, of how they should name things correctly. Final, finally, we, we, uh, we show the teams how to connect the systems. And again, this slide uh, is meant to show how, to tell them how we're going to check the model. Because uh, we do we do do a uh, check on this as well. Uh, this is just a, 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 a showing a view from our model viewer of when when and, when and if we want to isolate the supply system from the uh, parent uh, air handler uh, system to the uh, subsystems of the VAB boxes altogether. And this is the exhaust system, and uh, this is the plumbing system. So we're able to, to isolate them all connected if we need to. Um, in the model viewer. Um, so we require, once again, that, that uh, systems be connected properly and the design data uh, adds up correctly in the, in the schedules and in, this, in the system browser. And regarding the zones requirement, we, we, our zone requirements currently only applies to mechanical zones. 
um, not to any other kind of zone. Uh, and uh, uh, we have a naming, of course, for that as well to make sure that they are named consistently across buildings, like I mentioned. Um, this is this is further in instruction during kick of how to make systems in the model. Because uh, sometimes uh, that was necessary. So, excuse me, how to make zones in the model. Uh, so once again, like in, like in systems, we believe, believe that using the design tools within the modeling software will deliver us ultimate, ultimately a better design and, and ultimately a better building and, and better data for us to troubleshoot the building. Uh, as for example, if, if you don't have zones, you you don't you, you may have come up with a a, a design for the, for the piece of equipment, but if the space hasn't been enclosed correctly, you cannot uh, create the proper zone, and it's going to give you the right, the wrong sizing for the piece of equipment for this for this space. So it's all connected together. Uh, this this is an example of how, how a view might look in a model viewer. Uh, not only the zone, but also the corresponding system that feeds that zone. Uh, so again, the, uh, the rely on naming for zones on legacy sources like the National CAT standard. Uh, and uh, we came up we came up with this naming based on uh, asking our our, our uh, maintenance people and our, uh, our people from our energy management uh, uh, office. Regarding the model viewer, so uh, as as um, model viewer is a big part of what uh, of our process. Uh, we have design design team created created the and prepared the, the model for our viewer. And this is useful because if it's prepared correctly, uh, it's more useful for the downstream users like the GC team and uh, the owners. And again, this is a this is an average work NWD file showing all the disciplines combined together. And and this is uh, it's not that uh, much of a work I think because this is generally the same file and the same tools that are already used for class coordination. They just have to uh, prepare some. Uh, Additional things on it. There is a set way um, to organize the viewpoints that we require. There's a set way to to put the lighting, a set way to do camera angle, uh, transparency of the ceilings, equipment views, uh, floor views, and system views. Finally, a colorization of the model, as was, as you can see from the video, was useful, so it matches our other models. This is also useful when uh, we do our, our facilities walkthrough. Uh, with our shop supervisors and engineers. Academics is part of the requirement. Uh, this is a model viewer. Uh, the, rec the AE team is required to upload the model into Academics, and the uh, GC team is required to enter the data into Academics. Uh, we provide training for the AE and the GC on how to use Academics and uh, on their specific tasks. And uh, there is an assessment they have to go through. And after the assessment, they, they get a, a certificate. Uh, and they can they can get access and upload the models. There's a, this is an example of the sheet sheet of how showing some of the checklists they have to do to prepare the model up, prepare the model to get it uploaded. Of course, the documents requirement uh, is part of the, the one of the deliverables, um, COVID deliverables. Uh, this is more the responsibility of the GC. Uh, this is where it's called out. Um, our ongoing reference, our online reference documents. Excuse me. Uh, on our web page, they detail the requirement to upload, uh, whether it's to uh, to a COVID facility, to a COVID building, to a zone, or an asset, um, uh, whatever uh, Kobe, uh, It's organized by Kobe, uh, the COVID structure. And, and in case I forgot to mention uh, this before, uh, the Kobe documents do not replace our traditional closeout documents. This uh, supplement the, the other closeout documents. We still get the boxes and the and the CDs and, and USB drives. Uh, online, we also have a, a naming a guideline for our GC and airsofts, so we want the, the file names to be uh, done in a particular way. And of course, we check for print from model. Uh, this is done at milestones, uh, and again, this ensures that the model keeps, is updated as, as not only through the construction document stage, but through the construction administration stage. And because we get a model that we can rely on that will be useful uh, for our reference. So again. Uh, in summary, we want to believe that the right person is entering the right information at the right, with the right little bit of knowledge at the right time, and the next team member is able to continue down the timeline and add their own little bit of knowledge. This, this a little, as little knowledge drop as possible, 
and in the process, everyone gains efficiencies and hopefully benefits by uh, getting a better building, getting a better uh, design, and ultimately the owner gets uh, a better set of data to manage our facility. So this is another bit, little video showing uh, use case of how we will manage our assets. Uh, it kind of explains some of the views, the model preparations, the data is coming across. We have the model organized, the views organized by the design team prepared. As you can see, it's colored our way, and uh, you can see clearly what's air conditioning, what's piping, uh, the the building, and you have the data coming across. So if you clicked on the air handler's name properly, uh, you kind of scroll fast on the top, and the data is coming across uh, from the schedule, uh, and has the hook parameter, so it's able to create the hyperlinks to our, our enterprise document management system automatically and is repeatable. We're able to access the equipments. In this case, we're going to access the drawings and the manuals and uh, something relevant to the piece of equipment that it's uh, uh, to, the, to do our job. This is the balance report. We're going to be able to access the actually uh, the uh, training video that was used to during the uh, commissioning of the, of the building. This, as you can see, if you, this is the same view that we were looking at in the mind, in the uh, kind of the same view that we were looking at in the video in the model viewer. And we're able to link out to our energy management data, uh, system. This is a uh, gives us a live status of the condition of the build of the piece of equipment. Um, and this is made possible because the uh, the people enter the, the right all of the information, the hook parameters, they named it properly, and we're able to use the interface. So once again, the, these are the BIM deliverables. Uh, as I demonstrated, these are directly related to how we intend to use a model. Um, and uh, overall, uh, we have a better cost containment and we have gained, and gained uh, schedule efficiencies. We have able to do life cycle management with the model and the data. We have improved collaboration and communication. We have continuous transfer of knowledge and information to the different uh, team members. And it's important to put it in the contract. Uh, otherwise, uh, you have additional fees. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jose. Um, I do have questions, uh, lots of them actually. You, uh, you guys seem to be doing a lot of BIM work. So I guess my first question is, how long have you been doing BIM for? And how long did it take to develop your BIM guidelines? Well, uh, we, we started um, We started before, well, my <laughs> we started back in uh, maybe 2000. Six, like I said, looking at seriously at, at at requiring in our contracts, we started a little bit before that modeling internally. Um, the guidelines to answer your question took about a little over a year uh, to develop, and uh, it improved from uh, improvement took about to about two years from the first first re uh, revision to the last one, which is in 2014. And there's still uh, there's more list uh, on the more things to improve on, on the current guidelines. Always more have things. to improve, don't we? Always improving. Yeah, there are um, changes going on. All the time, yes. Um, well, t how about telling us about your existing staff and your, you know, your, your, your full-time employees and how many of them are able to update your Revit model um, and how you went and trained and did the migration over from CAD to BIM. So we have about seventy or uh, seventy over or seventy buildings uh, in Revit, uh, not all four twenty. So we're not moving all of them at once. Uh, so um, and so we uh, we have uh, as, you, as I mentioned, we have uh, rely on consultants to create a lot of the work and do it do it in our way. And so a lot of the work is already created by not only by the design team but also checked by these BIM consultants, which are four four companies. Uh, we're checking these uh, 16 projects, working on these 16 projects, so we're able to extend our capability that way. So in, in addition to my partial attention on BIM, I also do uh, maps and other things in CAD. Uh, we have one full-time person, and we have uh, um, 10 students who uh, do, uh, part, uh, half of them do uh, CAD or BIM at one time or another, updating the models. Great. And how is the model used by, you know, FMS in general? Is it strictly through Ecodomos and Navisworks? And what's the percentage of staff that are accessing the model viewer post-construction? 
Well, it, it's, uh, it's hard to quantify right now. I don't, don't have uh, good numbers for that, uh, to be honest. But we, we do, um, all of all the people in uh, my staff uh, do use um, a modeling uh, to, to do at least some of the space management. That's something we can do really easily. Uh, to do the other tasks, other use cases, uh, that uh, takes more training and, and more technology. Uh, we have these available in our um, different areas around the building, uh, but uh, we need more and more handhelds. We, we're not a, an iPad shop. We uh, really prefer Windows, and so it makes the handling people uh, surfaces a little more difficult. So uh, for, for space management and some of the uh, uh, visualization, we're able to use the rubber models much more. For some of the other use cases, the acceptance or the uh, implementation is a little bit uh, less widespread. And what about maintaining the models? What's your process for, you know, updating a BIM model to reflect a new renovation? Well, we, we've already gone through the process of uh, completing a building uh, through the regular process here, handing it off to the next design team because we we uh, finish a building and we're already changing it. That happens all the time. Um, so that 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 is uh, already happened. We we're able to hand off the model to the next next team. Now the other models, the ones we model internally, we uh, update them um, uh, as there are changes. Uh, we send out uh, students with lasers and cameras and tapes and uh, uh, sketch pads, and then we uh, uh, update the models. Uh, we update about 100 buildings uh, every year, uh, CAD or Revit. Um, so we're all, always updating all the time. And so I'm sure you have equipment that gets replaced, and so document linking needs to be maintained as well. What's your process for that? Well, uh, the links. The, the one key thing that I, I really insist on uh, is that these this this is an it should be automatic and, and should be, like I said automatic and repeatable. And so once you enter, once you replace the uh, the uh, family with uh, with something else, uh, there's if you if you put a new equipment number, then uh, the link should happen automatically. If the documents if the documents are there and the energy management control graphic is there, and uh, the, the link to our CMMS as well, and, and if they we use the same numbering, we use our CMMS equipment number. If the, if the information is there, the link happens automatically. There should be nothing I need to do except to, to replace the family, put in the parameter, update the, update, update the viewer, viewer, and the link should work. Uh, if it doesn't work, then I, I don't want to use that. Uh, it's, it's, it's too cumbersome. We, we went through the exercise of uh, creating Navisworks files, creating hyperlinks manually and all of that. So, But there's other detailed intricacies of how you replace the family, the GUID, it's, this is a, a large topic in itself. And so um, with your Ecodoma system, can you tell us what the pros and cons are that you've experienced in using it? Pros and cons? Yeah. <laughs> OK. Uh, let's see. Um, what do you like about it, and what do you think well, can be improved? Well, the, 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 but I, I'm on the phone with uh, or or online with, with these guys uh, daily, and they're responsive, and so there's a lot of improvements we do all the time. They do all the time. Um, literally, I'm I'm uh, on, the, on the line with Russia or India all the time. So uh, so there's a lot of room for improvements, I'm sure. Uh, but the, the cons are the automatic uh, automatic things uh, things about it. Uh, there are uh, uh, it works on the web. Um, and the uh, the, uh, the data is reusable and it's coming from directly from the model. There's a bi-directional link that is possible that could come from uh, that. Uh, if you update data on uh, on our CMMS, you're able to bring it back into the model and give it back to the next design team. We haven't tried that yet, uh, but uh, uh, that's uh, definitely that's something we're looking forward to doing. So, for example, if you change a piece of equipment in a CMMS. And you have uh, a different model number, uh, or a different serial number, or different uh, uh, information. You can feed it back into the model and give it back to the next design, design team. We haven't tried that. So again, there's there's some negatives, I'm sure. Uh, and I'm always on the phone with them, uh, or online, uh, and they improve things. Uh, but there's um, some good positives as well. 
No, if there weren't a lot of problems right now in our industry, we wouldn't be having this webinar series, right? We wouldn't be wanting to learn from each other. So I think that uh, we're just all in such a, 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 a new, um, new, new technologies. So what other systems, if any, at USC is your BIM integrated with? You mentioned some with space management. What about a GIS? Do you have a GIS at USC? And, and how does that play with BIM? Well, we, we do have a GIS. For, well, in fact, I have a webinar coming up, right, on uh, City Engine. So we try to we we try to reuse, and we also tried Infoworks um, as the GIS. Uh, we we tried different things. So we try to reuse our models in those systems. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to show you uh, in, a, in the webinar in June how we use these rubber models uh, to to visualize them in uh, City Engine. Um, so yes, we have some integration that way in, in GIS. Uh, well, the ones I listed on, online was uh, our, our energy management system, which is uh, Honeywell-based mostly, uh, our famous uh, CMMS system, and then our uh, um, Meridian document management, which a lot of people are familiar with. You know, those are, those, those, those are my tools. That's, that's what I use, and so that's what we link them into. There's, uh, I'm sure other things we can link them into, but um, those are the tools that are at USC. Okay, great. Um, I have a couple questions here from the audience. Uh, the first one here is from Peter Brigham, and he says, great presentation, and thank you. Uh, he, he'd like a recap on your staffing, which I believe you already went over, but also a, a recap on consultant resources used to support your BIM model. He'd like to know the relative cost compared to construction or total project cost and also any issues with getting deliverables on time? No, well, every project is different. Uh, and every consultant is different. And, uh, there are different challenges. Uh, so um, the, uh, we, we have certain requirements that's, that's listed in our guidelines, and, and it would be spelled out in detail during our kickoff meetings and during our different uh, executions, BIM execution sessions. There are staffing requirements for the design teams. Uh, they, are, they must have a BIM, BIM uh, manager, BIM coordinator and, uh, uh, present, and, and also working on, the, on our project, uh, depending on the size. Or they may have multiple ones, depending on, on, on the project. Uh, there was a project listed in that there has 1.1 million, I think, and so they needed multiple people. Um, so the, regarding the cost, uh, there's um, differences. I think we initially we, we were paying some additional costs for doing BIM uh, our way, because they, they used to say, that, you know, that's not normally what we do. Uh, and so that's why we came to, for the additional parameters, because people didn't want to rename families. Um, but eventually, I think that kind of started dropping off. And there's not, uh, there's an additional cost for sure. There's also an additional cost for uh, uh, the BIM consultant. And um, and uh, depending on the, uh, the project, the BIM consultant can be one person or uh, in, in multiple people. And so that the, the cost there uh, escalates uh, as well. But again, the, spending the money early is more uh, is really uh, we believe uh, uh, better than spending it much later fixing fixing things or or not getting what we want or getting a set of drawings that we really can't uh, can't trust on can't tr cannot trust for a reference. And so this would be ensure that it's it's the geometry is correct and the data is what we want uh, and and. We have we have an additional requirement for sure for for operations, but it, it delivers great benefit I think for uh, for design and, and for construction. Uh, they just less less change orders. Uh, there should be less change orders. Uh, but you know change orders and, and RFIs are not a, not only a function of BIM. It's also a function of, uh, of other things like uh, whether the team is collaborating and working properly together. And so uh, BIM is not going to fix all your problems. It's just uh, um, but we have these checks to ensure that it's really working for us our way. Peter also asks if there's a holdback on the contract uh, with payment, you know, uh, until the bid models are delivered, and if so, how big? Holdback. Uh, well, there's this monitoring from the very beginning, uh, and uh, so we, we some of the projects we withhold payment from 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 SD and DD. If they don't complete our deliverable at that point, because right? they're my, milestone checks and some models, uh, and they have to be done with a model. Uh, so, from the beginning, the answer is yes. 
And at the end, the answer is yes. Uh, and the, the holdback, it, it varies. Uh, again, there, there's, uh, there's way too many projects. But the, and also, the, actually, it also depends on the project manager. Because, you know, we, we do have a, a staff of about you know, 40 or 50 nowadays working on, all, on all, all of these projects. In addition to, the, to those projects, they, they probably have, uh, you know, 10 other projects that they're managing as well. Uh, and so uh, for most of the project managers, there is a, a, a payment that is withheld at the end. And I'm sure there, there's some who uh, go ahead and approve it without uh, checking with the, the, BIM, uh, the BIM committee, so to speak. But uh, it, it really varies with different projects. Uh, there is it's supposed to be a withholding there. The minority, very few of them don't withhold anything or, or don't check with uh, the BIM committee to make sure that everything has been delivered. Okay. Well, here's another question from Brad Hollis, and he says, thanks, Jose. So if there's a renovation to a building, your team will update the Revit model, export a Navisworks model, and put the new model in Echodomus. Is that correct? Correct. Well, that was easy. OK, and then our last question is from Scott Stocking, which I believe you might have already answered, but he asks, how do you manage the BIM model over time? For example, changes made to an existing BIM model or a BIM model for a building that is built over time to include new information not included in the original model. Well, we keep, keep a copy of it. Uh, our document management handles that revisions, and we can always go back and look at what that revision looked like. Uh, it's a little tougher with Revit these days because uh, you know uh, the old versions are, you know, they were in 2009 or 8 or whatever that was. Uh, I, I, there was a re so we can't actually open those, but the files are there. Um, every year we um, we try to up uh, update uh, those uh, internal models to the latest version uh, of Revit. Um, so. so it, it's a little tougher with Revit than with with, with CAD because you can still open up the CAD files, the older files. In this case, I have uh, uh, my 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 computers. I have uh, a version of uh, I think our Revit 11 and 12 and all the way to 15. Uh, but I can't open. So I don't want to open some of the older files because I I don't want to uh, update them. And sometimes it's very time consuming. So our document management, to answer your question, keeps track of those revisions. There are some some uh, some cases where we have, you know, 10, 20 different versions of CAD files and, 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 and Revit files. Not so many, but also similar amount of revisions if there are updates every year. I can go back to, I can go back and look at a file from, uh, uh, a CAD file from 1996 when we started using our document management uh, and then compare it to, uh, to a current file from today, from, from this year, uh, and look at the, how the space looked at different, uh, different times. As these here in AutoCAD, in Revit, that's a challenge. Uh, hmm. OK, well, that concludes our, our Q&A. Um, thank you so much, uh, Jose. I, I, I'd also like to thank all the attendees out there who joined us today. Um, I want to remind you that the next webinar in the Geotech Showcase is scheduled for two weeks from now, April 14th. Scott Stocking from the University of Chicago will be continuing the BIM theme by presenting on BIM and GIS convergence within a 3D model utilizing LiDAR data. And uh, for more information on future webinars in this series, please visit the CFTA website at www.cfta.org. Thank you so much, Jose. Thank you.